Thank you, Irma. Thank you everyone for joining us today for our DEI Lunch and Learn. For those of you who are not familiar with the term, DEI represents diversity, equity, and inclusion. I'm Jasmine Diaz. I'm a program manager at Rubric. DEI is not my official job title. This resonates with me because I love people. I wanna make a difference in the workplace and know that we can do better together. Data shows diversity promotes innovation, perspectives, employee engagement, and ultimately better decision-making. DEI is not a one and done. DEI is not something that we should do to comply or check a box. We do it because it's the right thing to do. Today, we'll be hearing from three amazing panelists on what DEI means in the workplace and why it's important. Rinky, over to you for an introduction, then Roger, and last but certainly, certainly not least, Ron. Hi everyone, thank you for joining. My name is Rinky Sati. I am the Chief Information Security Officer at Rubric. Um, I've been in the cybersecurity industry now for about 20 years, worked at companies like Palo Alto Networks, eBay, Intuit, Walmart.com, uh, IBM. Prior to joining Rubric, I've now been at Rubric for a year and a half. Um, I'm very passionate about diversity, about women in technology, and just in general, making environments really inclusive so people can bring their authentic selves to work. Um, I'm excited to share the floor here with Ron and Roger. Excellent, excellent. Well, thank you. Uh, my name is Roger Crockett. Uh, I am the Vice President and Head of Global Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion for Western Digital which is a global uh, data infrastructure company based here in Silicon Valley, actually based in San Jose, California. Um, we have uh, more than 60,000 employees in, in 39 countries uh, across the world. And I moved here to take on the responsibilities of DE&I uh, about a year and a half ago. I moved from Chicago, uh, where I had lived and worked for uh, more than 20 years. I was the Midwest Bureau Chief and a senior technology writer for Business Week magazine. And in that role, I covered the first revolution for increased diversity, equity, and inclusion in Silicon Valley, which was many years ago in the, uh, in the late 90s. Um, and now we're on the second or arguably the third in, um, in the wake of recent racial incidents, perhaps the third revolution. And, and always, whether I was a writer or now uh, as an executive at a technology company, my mission has always really been the same. Uh, it's been to help people become more aware uh, about issues of difference and about culture and about gender and really to arm them with the tools necessary to become more inclusive uh, in society today. So I'm, I'm delighted, thank you to, to Rubric, to Adelante, to uh, friends at uh, uh, the Hispanic uh, Foundation of Silicon Valley. Pleased to be with you all today. Thank you, Roger. Ron, over to you. Well, uh, th thank you, Jasmine, and uh, hi to Rinky and Roger. I look forward to our conversation this afternoon and thank you for joining us from wherever you're sitting in home or office or local park, whatever. Uh, I'm Ron Gonzalez. I'm the president and CEO of the Hispanic Foundation of Silicon Valley. Our foundation is about 30 years old now and we've existed in this valley both in Santa Clara County as well as now in the last five years in San Mateo County. That's our service area. Um, I've been with the foundation as its president and CEO for just about 10 and a half years. Our foundation's purpose is basically to improve the quality of life for Latino families and their children here in Silicon Valley. And we do that by focusing on three key priority areas. The first is something we call education excellence. And all of our education programs, whether they're from our programs around third grade reading literacy, up through high school programs, to and through college programs, are all focused on STEM education. We, str we, we strongly believe that the future of our community in this, in this region is directly tied to our ability to increase the number of Latinx professionals in the high-tech industry. 
Currently, our population represents about 27% of the general population of the region, but typically we only represent about 3% of the high-tech workforce and all the different companies that may be listening in today. And you have to understand that that's 3% of the entire workforce. We estimate that the technical employees are around 1%, so a very small percentage and a big gap that we are trying to fulfill uh, by trying to increase the number of Latinos in the, the high-tech job stream. Our second area of focus is leadership development. We have a very extensive and successful program to train Latinos who want to serve on the boards of directors for nonprofit organizations. And we've now graduated over 500 fellows, as we call them, from that academy. And over 70% of them have been placed on nonprofit boards of directors throughout the Bay Area. And then our third area of focus is what we call convening and engaging the Hispanic community. This is where we do our research. You can go to our website and download for free three research projects we've done dating back to 2011. Each of those research projects will give you tons of data on the quality of life that Latino families face here in Silicon Valley in five key areas, education excellence, uh, financial stability, housing, the environment, and um, healthcare. So we, we uh, enjoy doing our work. We have done a great job in the last uh, couple of months pivoting to, to Zoom broadcasting for all of our education programs. And we continue to work with Latino families and their children to hopefully change the trajectory of their lives, their families' lives, and the communities they live in. So thank you again for inviting me. Of course, thank you for joining us and making the time. Um, love to hear how passionate and, and everyone makes this a personal mission of their own to make things better uh, for all. Um, so with that said, I want to just dive right in and, and Roger, I'm going to start with you. Um, let me have you please expand a little more on the definition of DEI. What does that mean in the workplace? And, and then a second part of this question is you as a official um, head of diversity in your company, um, give us a glimpse of what it is that you do. Sure. Uh, so thank you for, for the question. Um, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, diversity is really about, in simple terms, it's about the mix, the mix of people. Diversity is really about the who um, and, and, and the who and all the various dimensions of, of difference, right? So what, what makes us unique as individuals is perhaps our race, or maybe it's our sexual orientation. Maybe it's uh, uh, our language, uh, other aspects of our, of our culture. Maybe it's our, our status, our veteran status, or our physical ability or mental ability or disability. Uh, those are the different dimensions and there are infinite number of di dimensions that make us unique as individuals, but it's having that, that mix of individuals in the workplace that's so critical to providing uh, a variety of perspectives and insights into the work that we do. So that's the diversity component. The equity part of it is really about balance, uh, the balance related to those people. Is that balance fair? Uh, is that balance in pay? Many of you have heard the term pay equity. Uh, are women, for example, or Latinos, for example, paid fairly in balance with others in the organization? Uh, or maybe that balance and that analysis of fairness has to do more with your job function or your job role, things like that. But that's that's that fairness uh, component is what we're talking about when we talk about equity. And then finally, inclusion. If diversity is about the who, inclusion is really about how. What are the behaviors that we use to, to create the environment in which we work? Diversity is really about the, about the workforce. Um, Inclusion is about the workplace. Again, that, 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 that environment. Uh, are, we, are we treating our people uh, fairly? 
Um, are we welcoming them? Are we valuing their contributions? Are we hearing them? Those are the behaviors that describe an inclusive workplace. Uh, it's not, diversity is really not enough to have those mix that mix. If we're not including people, making them feel welcome, valued, and heard, then we don't have the inclusion that, uh, that will really um, create better outcomes. So that's really what my role or the diversity officer and the diversity team at, uh, at a workplace, at a corporate environment is really all about. It's about um, making sure that proper mix and that proper environment exists within the organization. And let me just finally add that um, the diversity and inclusion team at any place of work cannot do it alone. The work really happens among the business leaders and the employees uh, across the organization. Uh, the, the diversity officer and office is really just an influencer, that the role is to share the influ influence, to, uh, to spread the understanding, the awareness, the value of diversity, but it's the work of everybody else to make that happen and to create um, an environment that's truly, truly inclusive. There are obviously all sorts of tools we use to do that, uh, to wield that influence, uh, but it's, it's, uh, it's an effort, a collective effort. Thank you, Roger. Um, so tied to that, uh, my next question for you is, what's the one line of reasoning or the logic that you use to influence uh, those business leaders that you talked about? Um, to, to get them to accelerate the DEI efforts and um, know that, make them aware that it, it is something that needs to be done. Wow, the one line of influence. Um, you know, I may need, to be honest with you, I may need to brush up on my one-liners uh, to, to build the most influence I can, but I'll tell you, in close to one line, I tell you what it used to be, it's a little different now. Let me explain why. What it used to be is about what I call business relevancy. That was not so much my one line, but my one phrase. Um, my counsel is that diversity had to be relevant to the business. This is inside corporations, right? Corporations exist, in our case, to produce uh, data storage devices and flash memory components. That's what we're in business to do. Unless I, unless the diversity and inclusion team can make diversity and inclusion relevant to the production of those products, we will not be successful. That's why we're here. And then it's about making sure that, um, that we explain the power of diversity to enable better business outcomes. So as an example of that, um, you know, Innovation is, is a big priority among companies all across technology and across industry. Well, innovation often happens uh, when two or more seemingly unconnected ideas get connected. And how do we get, how do we make that happen? You have to have diverse perspectives present, uh, diverse experiences present to make that special connections, those special connections happen. But that leads to greater business outcomes. Now what's different now, I think, in this extraordinary time, in the wake of the, uh, uh, the very painful, heartbreaking racial incidents and deaths that have occurred, is there has been this awakening across corporate America around the value of people, and particularly the difference reflected by those people. And so now I think that um, DNI is really around the foundation of what we, what, what, we're, what we represent as a company, our foundational values and, and, and mission as, as a company. And I would stress that now because that's before you know everyone every company talks about the importance of their of their values and uh, so that's key a, key a key sort of uh, evolution in 
how we describe diversity in its role. Thank you, Roger. Uh, Rinky, I'm gonna go over to you. Uh, my next question is, what steps or practices do you think are key for leadership uh, to take um, to build inclusion into the fabric and the DNA of their teams and across the board uh, overall into the corporate culture? So um, first of all, I think in order to have an inclusive environment, you really as leaders, we've got to broaden our definition of diverse. Um, you know, we hear a lot about gender equality. We hear a lot about racial equality and racial diversity and gender diversity. But that definition of diversity is beyond that, right? Do we have diversity around LGBTQ? Does diverse, our definition of diversity include those with um, physical disabilities or mental illness? Um, and so really broadening our definition and, you know, to that point, I have a I have a quick story that I'll share. Uh, you know, I've always been a strong representative um, of women in technology, women in cybersecurity, very passionate about bringing in more women. Um, and in that process, I was on a round table um, and I met an individual um, who was a security operations analyst that sat in a security operations center where there were monitors all around. Um, and, you know, your job, in my mind, requires you to look at these monitors and be able to derive kind of, you know, analytics and uh, decision making on security incidents. And what I learned was this individual was completely blind. And he was able to do his job as a blind individual in India, facing a lot of uh, adversity. And it kind of made me realize that I wasn't even, I didn't even think about that. And were there tools and did they, did the... It, are we making it accessible for individuals like that to do their best work and even to bring them into work? Um, and so I think constantly broadening our definition of diversity is so critical as leaders um, and helps us build then a more inclusive environment. Uh, the second thing I would say is really understanding the source of assumptions that we have, right? We've all been raised in certain ways. We've grown up in certain areas. We've, uh, you know, we're naturally gr um, raised as biased individuals. And I think it's really important to understand what assumptions are we making along the way? Understand those assumptions, surround yourself with people that can help you break down those barriers such that you're able to kind of understand your unconscious biases and then be around people that will help you, uh, com will help complement you in the right ways. Um, so I think that's super critical. And then, you know, it's not the last thing, but I think um, one of the other mo more important things is also align diversity and inclusion with your goals, right? Time and time again, we hear that you, you um, companies build better products, they build better, uh, they make more money, they have better innovation when your company has diversity and your company represents more of your customer base. Um, and, you know, there's so many story of, stories that support this. Um, one that quickly comes to mind is, you know, um, years ago when women weren't allowed in the workplace, the workplace was built such that the temperatures of the room were more conducive to men. And then when women started entering the workplace, when they sat a woman and a man side by side, the accuracy of what a woman would type would be lower than what that, in the same environment, a male individual um, would have typing accuracy at. And what they realized was that the temperature, strictly like the thermostat, <laughs> what it was set at wasn't comfortable for women. And that was one of the reasons. And when they, they, when they actually got the temperatures to something that was more comfortable for women, you know, the accuracy levels changed and they were pretty much aligned with uh, the male individuals. And so when you hear stories like this, um, you know, we've got to, it's not just having diversity, but then really listening and like ensuring that the environments that we create are inclusive to bring the best out of the individuals that there are. Yeah. Wow. That's, uh, that's interesting to hear and um, definitely believe that. So Thank you for, for sharing uh, the, the story. I also appreciate hearing about the, the worker that you met who had um, visual impairment and accommodations were made, right? Or, or tools were made available for him to be successful still. Uh, so Ron, I'm gonna turn over to you and ask uh, what is the most critical change and approach for companies to make uh, for them to be successful in the DEI space? Uh, thank you, Jasmine. Um, and Rinky, the first thing I'm going to do after shelter in place to, when I get to my office is check the thermostat temperature. <laughs> I hadn't thought of that. That's a that's a good that's a good uh, story. Um, 
the I think that, you know one of the one of the advantages I have is uh, I've been around for a little while and, and my career has been in a lot of different uh, sectors and I had the good fortune to work in high tech particularly for one of the best companies in the world at that time which was Hewlett Packard and one of the things that I learned in tech is that you know it's a simple phrase we've all used it in the past and that is what get what gets measured gets done and I find that one of the things that's been missing from the discussion around diversity, equity, and inclusion is the measurement part. It's, it's usually the weakest part. And, and I think that's about to change because many of us who have been watching as outside observers, all of the companies trying to, you know, find their ways to increase the diversity, equity, and inclusion in their companies, I'm sure are frustrated with the lack of results, the lack of measurement. While they may get measured, they're not, it's not producing results. And, and I think many of us in the, in the minority communities, particularly the Latino communities, are beginning to, to use a phrase that, that I think is, is uh, very appropriate. And that is that, you know, your actions are so loud, I can't hear what you're saying. And, and I think the time has come now for com companies to really uh, take the approach that Roger was suggesting earlier. And that is get these goals, get these objectives, get these mission statements down to the hiring managers. It's very important because, you know, as hard as Roger works, if, if the hiring manager interviews, you know, five to 10 people and keeps picking people that look and sound like him or go into the same schools that he went to, it's never going to change. And we'll be sitting here 10 years from now having the same conversation and the percentage of Latinos in high tech will be maybe five, 6%. African Americans, maybe three or four percent, and and we've not made any progress. So I think it's time for the leadership of these companies to do what they do on every other area of, of performance, and that is set out your objectives for each manager, tie some of those to accomplishing a more diverse and equitable and inclusive workforce. And if that manager meets those goals, reward him or her. If they don't, then obviously you've got to take some corrective action. I think it's come to that point. And I think the, the, what we're seeing in the streets of America now is this the same reaction that we're tired of the rhetoric, we're tired of the workshops, we're tired of the, the pamphlets. We want to see results. So become a results organization. It starts at the top, works down from there, but it's always around that, that, that layer of hiring managers that's so important. I've seen data that directly shows when that level of managers itself becomes more inclusive, more equitable, more, more uh, racially balanced, things change. They change. There's no doubt about it. And, and when more Latinos become middle-level managers, when more African-Americans become level man, uh, middle-level managers, likewise for Asian-Americans, Native Americans, gay, lesbian, trans transgender uh, individuals become managers, being the workforce changes. So you've got you've to have a disciplined approach, you've got to reward results, and look at changing when things don't result the way you want them to. Uh, your actions yeah, are so loud, your actions are so loud, I can't hear what you're saying. Uh, Jasmine, uh, if, if I could just uh, interject, and, and, and Ron, I'm giving you a, a virtual high five right now. Um, uh, it, because what you talk about the middle about the middle of the organization is so critical. Often in companies, as you suggest, that's what gets forgotten. Um, the middle of the organization, we, we focus so much at the top. What does the CEO say? What is the C, how is the CEO embracing this? That's critical. Don't get me wrong. It must start there. But we mustn't forget about the middle of the organization because what happens in the middle of organizations? Everything, everything happens in the middle of organizations. The CEOs make some decisions up here. How do things get done? Gets done in the middle of the organization. That's where we have to drive accountability and, and also to, to sort of uh, take off where, where Ron started. I totally agree in this idea of of, of, of measuring um, and, and it's also about 
uh, being transparent as well in order to drive accountability. So you have to establish measurements, but then you have to, to post and share those measurements so they're not hidden behind some curtain somewhere, but they're out there. So I'll, I'll just, I'll, in the spirit of transparency, I'll share because it's on our public facing website. Uh, Western Digital has about the level of representation among at least its, its uh, ethnic groups that, that Ron suggests. Single digits, mid to low single digits in Blacks and, and Latinos. Um, that's disappointing. But uh, we made a push to post that and share that. Why? Because it's the starting place for which we can get better. So next year, the idea, the goal is to be better than this year and we'll post it again and the following year will be better and better. So then hopefully in a few years from now, um, we won't be in a position that Ron talked about where things haven't gotten uh, gotten much much better. So yeah, that's the, the measurement and transparency is critical. Yeah, and I also think um, it's a journey, right? Also reminding ourselves that it's not, this isn't a problem that we're going to solve in one quarter, in two quarters. It's a journey and definitely a team effort, right? And uh, Roger, I'm glad to hear that uh, Western Digital publishes this information publicly um, because I think also for the leadership of your company, it's um, a driver to hold yourselves accountable, right? You're going to look at those numbers and know that you have to have better numbers next year and you're going to be relentless to achieve those goals. So that's great to hear. Uh, so my next question is actually, I'm going to say with you, Roger, um, and given the, the historical and current social events that you've already uh, mentioned, um, how can we be better allies to the Black community, in your opinion? Uh, well, thank you for that question. And um, the first place I want to start is just to, to recognize that there is a silver lining uh, within the heartache, the pain uh, that has come from uh, the racial incidents, uh, the killing of George Floyd and others. But, but the promise that I see is that finally, literally after hundreds of years of discrimination against, racism against, oppression against uh, black and brown individuals in this country and flank, frankly across the world. We've arrived, we've arrived at a place, I think a moment that we must seize of uh, all of us uh, to create change. Individuals who are not in this case black are asking themselves and I mean genuinely concerned about what they can do to help, what they can do to be better, what they can do to, to, to yes, acknowledge their privilege, uh, to examine and explore their own uh, feelings, uh, their own biases, as Rinky said, um, and to really uh, do that self-analysis and, and try hard to learn and arrive at a better place. So, what I would suggest that other communities do to rally around this moment is to go on that journey, uh, Jasmine, to use your term, that, that, that personal journey to arrive at what I call this, um, this sort of, uh, this ultimate state, this ideal state of racial competence. <clears throat> and, and the journey includes this. Uh, I'll just share the high points. The journey for individuals it's first through a, a fear zone. That's where a lot of people reside and have resided in, in recent years, in that fear zone where they're, they're, they're afraid to push through their discomfort, their discomfort with race. So I'm not gonna explore that. I'm not gonna ask questions because um, it's uncomfortable. It's difficult to do. Um, they, they're in denial in the fear zone denying that perhaps they may have some unconscious or subliminal biases or racist tendencies. When you push be beyond that fear zone to a learning zone, 
And that's what I encourage people to do, to push beyond that. Because what there's a saying, everything that we want, everything we want is on the other side of fear. So in this case, becoming a better in more inclusive individuals on the other side of that fear and doing the kind of learning and self-exploration you need to do to get there is important. And when you do that, then ultimately you arrive at that ideal zone, which is the growth zone, where you sit comfortably within your own discomfort, where you speak up for uh, against racism uh, and for justice, where you're not silent, uh, where you're continuing your lo learning and improvement as an individual. So I would just ask that people really commit to that personal journey and commit to helping others in their organizations on that journey as well. Yeah, thank, thank you, Roger. And, and just to add to that, um, I definitely agree. I think it starts with educating oneself about you know, the different people that, that are part of this world with us together. And I think that what, when that happens, those uncomfortable conversations, that's where the change can begin, right? So acknowledging we all do have some sort of uh, bias that we were raised with um, and it was instilled. Um, so I think that's definitely a great um, step to, to try to make that change. So Ron and Rinky, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Um, so similar question, but this would be, how can we be better allies to the Latinx community, women, uh, LGBT, vets, uh, people with disabilities? What are your thoughts on, on that regard? Go ahead, Rinky. All right, um, so I think, um, you know, Roger nailed it when he talks about learning. Um, you know, I, jumping onto this call um, and, you know, just talking, knowing that um, I had I had my own fears. I've never spoken up and talked about how we can be better allies for the Black community in fear of, hey, I might say the wrong thing. And I was just, you know, talking to uh, Ron and uh, Roger before the call about that too. And so I think, under, you know, when you think about the movement that's happening right now, the protests, it's, you know, the community saying, understand our stories, listen to us. Um, they, you know, Black community has been facing adversity for now centuries. They, they face it every single day. And finally, the moments come where it's hear our stories, understand what we're going through, understand. And I think you can expand that when you think about women in tech or you think about the Hispanic community. I think you can, you know, all of us are human beings and understanding what each individual is going through as a person. And, you know, there's a lot of things that are unfair out there. And I think the more that we can learn and educate ourselves um, around how we can be better allies, it's the best thing we can do right now. Um, and so, uh, you know, for me, one of the mo more uncomfortable things I've done uh, recently is I joined, you know, Jazz as um, the executive sponsor for Adelante at rubric and you know i'm learning through this process you know jazz and irma and others that are part of the group teach me every day that here's you know you know here are the numbers when it comes to uh, the Latinx community, or here's what we can do better, um, you know, and here's where we need help. And so I'm learning, I'm listening, and I think as leaders, that's what we need to do. And, you know, for all of the under underrepresented communities, whether it's pride groups, um, whether it's Latin groups, Black community, um, what, you know, women, I think it's very um, important that we take this time to understand and educate ourselves so we can be better allies. Thank you, Rinky. Ron? Yeah, I, I would just add uh, to Roger and Mickey's comments. Uh, I, I think it starts with self-examination. You know, both Roger and Rinky mentioned this, that we were never born with prejudice in our system, but we certainly learned it along the way in a variety of ways, depending on what community and what type of household you were raised in. So self-examination, I think, is the first step. I will say this. I, I don't know that any other time in my life do I remember the explosion of feelings being expressed than what we see today. I mean, there is never a loss on ever any social media site you look at or use uh, during the day at the number of African Americans, the number of Latino Americans, the number of minority Americans who are expressing stories, real true life experiences. And, and I think particularly if you're not uh, minority, um, read those stories, understand them, appreciate them, accept them. It's, it's going to be hard. It's very hard for all of us to recognize that our entire system, as great as this country is, 
don't don't mistake me here. I mean, I, I was born here, I was raised here. There's no country, in my opinion, better. But we have to get better. And getting better means self-examining. It means investing the time. This is not easy. Just like um, diversity, equity, inclusion, as Jasmine said, it's not gonna it's not gonna be done in a decade. I mean, you have to understand these institutions, these systems, these results have taken uh, decades to build on. And so, you know, if you're a corporate leader, don't expect that your company is going to go from 3% Latino employee population to 10% in a, in a 24 month period of time. There's a funnel that has to be created. That funnel has been ignored by white America uh, and, and has not, you know, it, it goes all the way back to the types of education systems that our children go to. Uh, that are that, that you know you've seen these reports recently here in Silicon Valley of the inequity between the white population and the non-white population. Well, that's not news to our foundation. We created the, we created that data like that back in 2011. The, the reality is that even in 2011, that reality has existed in our community for decades before that. So it's going to take a lot of effort. But if there's any country, and I truly believe this, where we can turn this around, uh, it's our country. You know, I'm reminded um, that uh, of a story I had myself uh, some time ago. I, I'm lucky to have raised three three daughters, and when they were still in the household, and we were having dinner one night. Uh, my oldest daughter, I think she was in in that level in education where they were studying U.S. history and civics and all that stuff. And she asked me. She said, "Dad, do you think we'll ever have a black president?" And I said, you know, I have to be honest, I don't think that's going to happen in my lifetime, but I certainly hope and it happens in your lifetime. And then out of nowhere, this guy Obama comes onto the scene, right? And he gets elected president. And I'm thinking, holy Toledo, we just fast forward U.S. history videotape, you know, three hours. And, and we've made so much progress literally overnight in one election. And eight years later, you know, here we are three steps forward, 20 steps backwards. So it's going to take a lot of discipline and a lot of effort on each of our parts. And you know what, I, if, if I could, Jasmine, I just have to uh, sort of uh, pick up on, on Ron's statement again, as he mentioned. You're going to have to pay me a, a finder's fee, Roger, for all these uh, pickups. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll, pay you, I'll pay you later. I'll pay you later. Uh, but... Uh, no, you mentioned what was, I, I, was, I was like you, Ron, I, I, I certainly was hopeful that we have a president uh, of color in the White House during my lifetime. I did not expect it. I was hoping we would have a woman, uh, mm -hmm. and I'm still hopeful that, uh, that we would have a woman uh, one day. But what I think is, I've been really thinking hard about what the difference is, what the we've all talked about the response to the injustices that we've seen uh, in the last few weeks. Remember that the, um, the folks that we see out on the streets protesting, they aren't all, all, they aren't all young, but many of them are young people, and not just black people, but young white people and Asian people, and it's the rainbow of protests. But many of these individuals, are the individuals that came of age during the reign of a black president. Mm -hmm. And even, even if by osmosis, just that, just seeing that there is possibility for everyone, a person that looks like him can be and should be, be able to become president. The way that shapes our consciousness and our perspectives and our beliefs is is dramatic and i think we're seeing that play out on the streets across across america and across the world so i have a great deal of promise that the young folks are out there protesting who will become our bosses uh eventually um will bring a whole new mindset and a whole new commitment to to corporate america and and across uh, the world thank you roger um, so um, I want to take a quick moment to pause here and just uh, remind our attendees that we'll be heading over to you for Q&A in just a few moments. So please get your questions warmed up and ready for Rinky, Ron, and Roger. Um, and be, in the interest of time, I think I'm going to ask one more question um, and then hand it over to Irma for the Q&A. 
So uh, Roger, this is a two-part question and please Rinky and, and Ron also elaborate and expand on it. Um, it. My question is how do you drive the awareness and manage the accountability in the workplace? So you talked earlier about metrics, but how do you really push and drive it and, and really get that accountability, accountability that we talked about earlier? Um, and I know that we have a lot of people of influence and leadership positions um, attending today. So this is an opportunity to, to say it so that they can all hear it. Okay, wow. Um, <clears throat> well, I'll try. Uh, that is, that's a really important question. One we're, we're, we're all striving to do our best to achieve. But for me, it comes down to um, three C's. Uh, I mean, we, we, we've talked about the metrics. Metrics, are, I think, are really, really critical to, uh, uh, to driving accountability. Uh, but the C's are first uh, commitment and then um, competency or perhaps capacity comes first and then competency. So we, we, we first have to have the commitment. And commitment has to be Frankly, even you know, even even deeper than just writing down something on a piece of paper or embedding something in a document, a PowerPoint somewhere. There has to really be a true, genuine commitment to to driving change. Sometimes the commitment is uh, reflected, is demonstrated through another C: compensation. So you can drive accountability, making people be committed because you compensate them for something. Their, their pay is going to reflect what they do or don't do. Now that's a way to get someone to pay attention. But you also have to be understand that the, that the organization and even the individual has the capacity to be able to execute on something. Do, are there the requisite resources, either human resources, individuals on a team to drive the metrics you're trying to drive, uh, the financial resources, whatever it is, is there the capacity in the organization uh, to, to enable that accountability? Uh, and, it, and do you have the requisite uh, competence out there among your resources uh, to really achieve your, your goals? So I think if you if you pay attention to those, those components, <laughs> no pun intended, no, no, <laughs> didn't mean to use another C. Another C. <laughs> if, you, if you pay attention to those, uh, then I think you, you, can, you can make a lot of headway uh, when it comes to accountability and, and, uh, and action. Great, thank you, Roger. Ron, Rinky, anything to add before we okay, hand it over wait, for Q&A? Let Rinky go next. Okay. Yeah, I just, um, I wanted to add to the accountability piece, you know, and this may sound a little bit more tactical. I mean, completely uh, um, agree on the three C's and what Roger um, has mentioned. You know, there's, I think compensation and all those things are important. When you look at a lot of these movements that are happening, you know, people are very passionate about causes, especially young people that are entering the workplace. And I think one of the most important things that as leaders, we've, and, you know, we talked about this more at a more kind of um, in an abstract way earlier, but there's things that happen at work and I'm, we've all been a part of it that where someone's felt left out or something has been said that makes it a not inclusive environment. And several people notice it. We feel it, we hear it, and people will shy away from saying anything. There'll be senior leaders in the room where they'll shy away because of the fear of, how do I talk about this in a way that's appropriate? Or how do I mention this? Or, you know, just with, at the fear of conflict. And I think that's accountability that we as leaders need to speak up when something like that happens, pull the person aside, talk to them about, hey, that, you know, I'm not sure. And some, and I, I and, you know, uh, giving the benefit of the doubt, many times those situations, they're unintentional. The person doesn't even know that that wasn't, you know, that, um, that that may have hurt someone or create an environment that was not inclusive. So I think it's really important that if we are in a position of, you know, in a leadership position or we're, have, um, we're empowered to do so, that we pull those folks aside and talk to them about, hey, that's, not, that's probably not the best way. And I think, you know, going back to the theme of 
learning and education. I think that inclusive environment and teaching people along the way is so, so important. And that's one way that we can drive accountability with each other, whether it's a, in a company, whether it's in a group setting with friends, whatever it might be. I think it's, it's so important that we teach each other along the way. Well, I would, I would associate myself with both Roger's comments and Rinky's comments, uh, so not to repeat what they've said, uh, other than to add maybe another seat to Roger's list, and that's continuity. I think one of the biggest challenges that someone like Roger is going to face, and probably already is facing, is that as, as CEOs think about this issue of diversity, equity, inclusion, I'm hoping that they don't just sign up you know, make the conversion overnight. This is, this is a process where they really have to think it through. They have to, you know, have their, their upper management commitment to it down to their middle management commitment, which we talked about earlier. The continuity part, I think, is going to be the most uh, difficult part for particularly high tech to make. I think there'll be some strides around uh, the area of diversity, diversifying the workforce, even possibly equity in terms of making people feel somewhat welcome. But I think the inclusion is going to be the hardest part. And we're already seeing this. We're seeing that high tech is having real issues with retaining Latino, African American, women workers. And, and I've had many, many of those population groups talking to me about their experience working in these companies for a couple of years and, and the culture uh, is gonna have to change. You know, this, this, what they call it, frat boy kind of culture is not something that's attractive to minority men or women and, and all women. And, and so what's, what's kind of been viewed as the industry's attractiveness, oh, you know, it's, it's a great place to work and we have a lot of fun. You know, that's attractive to certain people. It's not attractive to others. And so, you know, we're going to have to figure out what, even without the relationships of COVID-19 and what the new normal is, we're going to have to do a lot of work around the future workplace. And I don't, I don't see that taking place. I'm not, maybe there is studies out there and universities looking at that. I certainly hope so. But we're going to have to make some major, major changes there. It's, it's not, it's just not just about going to college campuses that have high, you know, populations of, of Blacks and, and Latinos and Asians and so forth. It's, it's, it's a lot, a lot of work. So Roger, you know, he, his role should be senior vice president. They, he should be reporting directly uh, to the CEO or any person in his position shouldn't have a layer between him or her and the CEO. Uh, it's it's going to be that important. Um, and, and if we don't do this, if we don't to see, you know, see this change over a reasonable period of time, let's say five to 10 years, you're going to see the same kind of reaction in the workplace that we're seeing on America's streets. It's not going to be pretty, in my opinion. Thank you, Ron. Sure. I want to uh, stop here for a moment and uh, allow Irma to tee up some questions from the audience. Irma? Okay. So it looks like we have Solomon Wilkins. Solomon? Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes. This question, question is for for any of you, but Ron, I appreciated your last comment, suggesting, suggesting that Roger should be an SVP reporting directly to the CEO. I absolutely have been adamant about senior leaders and companies having a direct line of com communication directly to the CEO. But when you think, like one of the things you said, Ron, that I thought was really powerful was it's not just about going to college campuses and trying to find, like going to historically black colleges and universities and trying to diversify your company that way because there's a framework that would suggest that it's more than just attracting talent, right? So you think about how do you engage that talent once you, once you get them there, how do you develop that talent, and ultimately how do you retain that talent? So thinking through that, um, what, what do you think companies should be focused on to change the culture, right? You talked about a frat boy mentality and so on and so forth. What do you think companies could really, because yes, everybody's going to go out and say, hey, we need more black people. We need more Latin people. But once they get to the company, what do you think companies need to be focused on to ensure that they're happy and that they can stay? Well, I, I would say, and I'd be interested in Roger and Rinky's thoughts also. Um, I would say make sure the people around the table 
represent the diversity of your workforce. When, there, when you have good representation around any discussion table, I, I see that these kinds of cultures are gonna start falling away. Because what, what's happening right now are the people who plan events, the people who, who, who plan things that happen within the company, tend to be young white males. And you know, they're gonna, they're gonna put on the table of things, events, these kind of thing, things they like to do. But once you start diversifying that table, you're gonna have someone like me that says, um, I'm sorry, but that's, that, I'm just not attracted to that. Let's, let's try something different. Let's try to find something that will be welcoming to everybody. So you know, this, this inclusion really, for inclusion for me is the issue of being welcomed to the table being part of the decision-making process. Uh, whether I'm an entry-level employee, middle manager, upper manager, or executive. I mean, uh, that, those tables, you know, in those conference rooms need to be much different and have different people around than they're, they're currently have. So I would say, make sure that as the culture is being thought about, we're, we're making sure that everyone's involved in that discussion. Thank you, Ron. Thanks. Next up, we have John McCurcher. I apologize if I said that wrong. John, are you up? I am here. Yes, Jack McCurcher. Hey, Roger. Been a minute. How are you, sir? Very well, sir. Good to see you. Good to see you. I'm in San Diego now, not in Chicago anymore, my man. But uh, I was wondering, you know, for for the technology sector and some of our youth that aren't even, we're talking about getting people in jobs in the workplace from different areas, right, that aren't even getting educated or thinking about technology type positions. What are good places, good, um, good programs, good ways to teach our youth so they have aspirations to do some of these things that we're all trying so hard to get, you know, diversity inclusion for. And any idea, I know it's a tougher question, right? But I know each city could have things or different programs. Um, I've done Big Brother stuff, but to do it on a broader scale is a little tougher, right? Yeah, so Jack, Thank you for the, the question and I'll start. And, um, and then I know that, that, that Ron for sure and probably Ricky have some, some suggestions of their own, but there, there really are a number of really, really fine organizations out there all over uh, the country. Um, but a couple that come to mind immediately, uh, again, we're talking about some of the, the racial incidents that have occurred. So it makes me think of, for example, uh, the Green Scholars Program, which is a program uh, focused on youth, particularly uh, black youth, because it's named after, after Frank Green, who's one of the early uh, successful uh, black engineers and, and business owners uh, in, the, in Silicon Valley. So there's a program there. And I have friends whose children have gone through that as an extraordinary program, providing exposure uh, to young black kids uh, to this, to, to STEM fields and encouraging them to pursue STEM fields is really what, what we need to get that encouragement at an early age. There's, there's organizations like Black Girls Code uh, that are helpful in that regard. Uh, but there's also, there's organizations for so many uh, uh, communities of difference. I know that right now during Pride Month, our LGBTQ uh, business Resource Group is doing an event this Friday that um, is in partnership with the Trevor Project. And the Trevor Project is an organization dedicated to creating opportunities for young individuals in the LGBTQ community. So those are just a couple of examples. Um, and, and, and I'm going to just let Ron and Rinky sort of add from there. Yeah, sure. I, I would... Yeah, I was just going to add, um, you know, to prior company that I was at, um, we had partnered with the Girl Scouts uh, to create cybersecurity badges as an example to every single zip code because, and, and you're seeing more companies partnering with the Girl Scouts or, you know, the Boy Scouts um, to create this because they're realizing that, you know, every zip code doesn't have access to the same education around the, around the U.S., um, and so getting that and getting th that kind of curriculum out so that those kids can then not just arm themselves with the knowledge, but then teach their parents and teach their siblings and teach their communities 
around these different topics um, and um, hopefully pursue careers in, in those areas as well. Um, you know, Rubric has partnered with organizations to help um, kids, you know, that are either coding or bit launching uh, or thinking about building a mobile app or anything and things like that. So there's a lot of organizations locally. Or, uh, there's local museums that have like innovation days where you can go build robotics and things. I know our our, um, uh, their, uh, our tech museum here in the Bay Area in San Jose. Uh, has a program like that where kids can compete. So there's so many programs I think that are that are accessible and um, open to everybody, and where they'll even pair you if you don't have um, access to the knowledge or what you need to participate. They'll pair you with mentors and things like that from companies, so you can get the exposure um, and you kind of have fair footing there. Very quickly, because I know we're bumping up against the time, I'll race through this very quickly. Um, many Latinos I talk with that are in tech call themselves unicorns because oftentimes when they're in the workforce or at a meeting in the workforce they're the, the only Latino and so this idea that we try to promote within the foundation is if I see it I believe it. it's an old saying Roger probably remembers it if I see it I believe it and our objective is to get young Latino students in front of other Latinos who are in tech so we work with Latino students from third grade through middle school math and algebra success programs High, numerous high school programs. We do everything from training Latino students how to take the SAT exam to helping them understand all of the skills and, and, and techniques they're gonna need to be not just surviving college education, but thriving in college. We're supporting over 300 Latino STEM scholars in universities and colleges throughout the country. We're also helping them find uh, summer internships in companies and ultimately full-time jobs. So th this is the grunt work that has to take place. And we have to work in low income, underserved school districts, where quite frankly, the education programs don't measure up to all the other neighborhoods here in Silicon Valley. So it's, it's starting young, it's focusing on getting results and impact. And then same as I said before, measuring that impact, measuring our results. Thank Thanks you. for the question. All right, so I think we are um, at time. Um, if we didn't get to your question, uh, we apologize, um, but please do email us. We, um, we have the emails on the flyer um, for both the Hispanic Foundation and Adelante. Um, please, yeah, we welcome your, your questions and, and further engagement. Um, so to close, I just want to encourage all of you that joined us today to, to please um, take that first step, right? Uh, diversify your people portfolio, if you will. Um, get, get to know someone that's not like you. 80% uh, of us surround ourselves with people, you know, outside of work that are probably just like us, who look like us, who think like us, who grew up similar to, to how we did. Um, and I believe that if, if we all take a step to engage and have those uncomfortable conversations, um, those real conversations that are eye-opening, uh, they expose differences and will enable us all together to push towards that change. Um, and ultimately, I ask you all to continue to connect and advocate and, and support. Thank you.